In the world of athletic performance training, and when we're specifically talking about output, so high output skills like throwing hard, jumping high, sprinting fast, variability and randomness is an important component that can help bring the training to an high, a higher and more sustainable level over time. And so why is this? Well, to start, I'll have a little bit of a story uh, or an anecdote, if you will, and that's in the world of track and field, uh, especially in high school and sometimes in college as well, especially like on the lower uh, divisions. So division three, where athletes are more inclined to play multiple sports, athletes will do basketball and then they'll go, uh, get off the basketball court and they'll go do track and they'll do high jump, long jump, uh, maybe the sprints or hurdles. And you see it really in the jumps and especially high jump, just because that pairs well with basketball. If you can dunk and you like jumping and you're tall, you're probably going to be pretty decent at high jump. And so what is oftentimes seen, um, not, just, uh, not just that I've seen, but other coaches as well, uh, I've even, even seen and spoke with athletes whose high jump careers were revitalized because they got back to playing basketball. But um, what happens a lot of times is that athlete will get into track season and start jumping. And just right off the bat, they're jumping really well, really high. But the more they do the exact same thing, over and over and over again, which so high jump, for example, it's the exact same approach, exact same type of jump, exact same stresses on the joints. Relatively speaking, you might do like a scissor jump or a flop and some somewhat different jumps. But compared to basketball, where you're doing all sorts of different cuts and accelerations, all sorts of different jumps with different ground contact times and different vectors, uh, you have just this massive variability in basketball. And very little in track. Anyways, after a few weeks of going from big variability to little, you start to see athletes will oftentimes plateau quickly in high jump. I've seen uh, back in Division Three, <laughs> there was an athlete who literally like rolled off of the basketball court after his season was done, went and won, uh, or at least was top three. I think eventually he did win it after I left um, that Division Three to go be a strength coach on the D1 level, but uh, win, basically wins high jump indoors in March and then doesn't jump any higher once he starts specializing in high jump outdoors. And this kind of thing happens quite often. And I found that in working with high jumpers in that same environment that those basketball players, if you would actually let them go play uh, or do open gyms once or twice a week uh, throughout track season, they actually retain their spring really, really well. So uh, variability, I, I want to talk about uh, why it's important, which I guess I just did, uh, because it helps having a little bit more of a diversity in how joints are loaded is really good for the nervous system not saying, hey, you have just bashed this one singular skill and impact pattern over and over and over again. And when the nervous system um, sees that the brain and body is really hammering that skill or that that pathway, it'll shut things down out of safety. I mean, in high jump especially, where you're coming in on this angle and just putting everything into this semi-rigid plant leg that does have to yield, but it's coming down with a lot of force, projecting your body upwards, there's rotation involved. So there's a lot of stress impact. And if you do that over and over the exact same thing, eventually the nervous system is gonna get sick of the fact that you're loading your joints the exact same way. And it's you're not gonna jump as high. It's One day you're gonna walk up to the high jump mat and you're just gonna feel so flat. And then guess what? Go play basketball for a week or two and you're gonna get it back. So that's an example of how that works and how that can be infused into training. And I'll follow that example up with a, a uh, research study that <laughs> it's funny because it's like, well, go look it up at this link. It's actually not at the link. The only place I can tell you that I've seen this study is one in Easy Strength by Dan John and Pavel Setzelin where they reference it. And then it's actually referenced in this, make sure the, the light's not screwing this up. This book, this classic, The Science of Sports Training, uh, by Thomas Kurz. So it's referenced in this book, but you're not going to go on PubMed and find the study. Sadly, it's in here. It's the, the Ruzon study. I mention this all the time, but basically the gist of the study is that you had two groups of long jumpers. And this does, this fits with, even if this isn't, your sport isn't track, if you're a team sport, you just want to get faster or jump higher or get stronger or do something uh, more singularly, like throw faster. Within the sport, you want to do a skill, an output-based skill better. Um, then this is important. So 
The Ruzan study had two groups of long jumpers, one of them every jump in training. So I think they trained for eight, 12 weeks, uh, whatever the standard block of training time that you could research and test and retest is. The first group did only uh, maximal jumps. Every jump was as far as possible. This is probably the standard in jumps training for the most part. Usually uh, athletes are not going to uh, they're usually going to jump as far as they can unless the coach is giving them a specific technical cue and saying, well, don't worry about distance, just try to do this thing, um, et cetera, et cetera. But usually in, in track or whatever, uh, depth jumps and plyometrics for team sports, usually the, uh, the objective is try to jump as high as possible. Now, that's not a bad thing, but it, it can be for the re- aforementioned reasons if it's high impact enough and you're doing it over and over and over again. So Uh, The other group was the variable group. So they jumped to different uh, targeted distances in the sand. So not all maximal. Maybe if my best was 25 feet, maybe some jumps, there's a hoop and it's like 20 feet. I got to get right in that hoop. One's 22. I got to jump right in that hoop and so on and so forth. So there was scattered distances. And you could apply that not just to long jump. You could could do that with javelin, you know, different cones or buckets out on the, out on the range you're throwing or Pretty much any event, you can do something like that. Anyways, at the end of the study, what group jumped further? The group that actually practiced every single time jumping as far as possible, or the group that had a, a diverse, um, you know, obviously it's not completely diverse. They're not like, you know, jumping like off to the side, like through a flaming hoop or something like, right, you can get too crazy with anything. But within a somewhat specific bandwidth and having variability, the variability group jumped further in the end than the maximal group. And I find this interesting. And I think that it kind of goes with the, uh, you could call it like feminine and masculine, left brain, right brain, yin and yang, like hard and soft, whatever. Uh, a training, um, I believe that most training uh, today is approached from a little bit more of that left brain, a little bit more like machine-like, like like, uh, like a math equation, like you could call it more masculine, more of that that hard, like everything's uh, max, everything's max intent, you know, everything's got to be, you know, go, go, go. And to an extent, I mean, we want to have the ability to powerfully harness that intention without question. Uh, but unless the body is kind of given the chance to organize uh, and not be overly in your head about it uh, with a lot of different solutions, the, the, the spectrum of distances, then you never can really, um, I believe you never really get to re- reach your full potential. It's kind of like dunking too. Would you um, rather be really good at, or practice, not really good, but would you rather practice just doing one dunk on a 10 foot hoop? All you could do is just jump off one leg, just barely get it with one hand. Or would it be better to put the hoop to nine feet and be able to do 10 or 15 types of dunks? Ultimately, and, and if you watch like the way that I think like people who do dunking, like pro dunking have advanced along. I would contend to say that a really big part of the the thrust of their training is the diversity, the not just doing one thing. It would be kind of boring. Um, You could say the same thing, honestly, with like rock climbers too. If you've ever been to a rock climbing gym um, and I spent a few years of my life rock climbing before my children were born and I'd like to get back into it on a level again, there was a lot of guys there who could do one arm pull-ups and you don't, you know, you don't go to Planet Fitness or, or whatever, or the YMCA or, or the Health Plex or wherever you're going to train and see a whole lot of people who could do one-arm pull-ups, even the people who are really dedicated fitness folk who are really, you know, cranking pull-ups and lap pull-downs and things, they can't do a one-arm pull-up. But in rock climbing, this just diversity, like all sorts of different grips. And it's not just the diversity, there is a lot of intention and emotion and and like just present mindedness behind it where you're not Um, You're not even getting in your head too much thinking about, oh, well, what's the optimal perfect technique to hit this head of the muscle? It's like, no, you're just doing the thing and your body adapts to it. So we um, we have these elements all working together. So diversity in training, how does this play out in the average training session? And let's just say within the scope of, you could say just a strength and conditioning, a general athletic performance session. I know not everyone listening to this is a track and field. Um, coach or competitor. And so these these concepts are completely universal. And so, for example, how can we create a, um, let's just say we're doing sprinting, for example. How can we use um, randomness, variability, diversity, chaos to enhance that session? Well, a few things. Well, one, just look at the symbiosis between football and track. And that in itself 
is oftentimes enough to create that diversity. If you're going, you have you have football season, massive diversity. You got track season, and it goes back and forth. Uh, but I believe there should always be, you know, like like the yin and yang symbol. Like you have like the the little the little bit of yin within the yang, and the little bit of yang within the yin. So I I believe that within you have that variability in football, but then you go into track season and you have that little bit of variability that football gives you within track season, if that makes sense. Something, just something should always be there. Again, if we, if we train, we always, we always want to be, we need to have a structured enough level of training that sends us towards the goal. So the epitome of this could be like, if you're familiar with the Bonderchuk training system in throws, they do the exact same workout every single day, the exact same amount of throws, lifts, even the same weight on the bar. They don't even add weight week to week as far as the, the standard um, version of that training goes, as I'm aware of. And the progress, the throw progress is tracked until the athlete doesn't throw any farther. They start getting worse. All the exercises are then changed and you start the cycle over again. You do a little washout period between cycles. And so there is like, and that works very well. And I believe though, I think uh, from what I've read, or I'm, yeah, I haven't actually trained with Bondarchuk, but those athletes did like play basketball for restoration, for mental restoration. They got that variability through through that. I, again, I don't know how exactly that played in, but it is important to have a structure to get somewhere in training. It can't all be completely and utterly random. However, there's, it's just, there's just a spectrum of it. So anyways, uh, let's just talk about sprinting, some ways that you could infuse that within a sprint training session. Uh, you could warm up with, let's just say, their mini hurdles is very common, like four to six inch hurdles, I'm sprinting over them. Uh, and maybe I'll do that before a max velocity training session. I'm going to run uh, 10 meter flies, 30 meter flies. Well, you could have those mini hurdles at uh, random and odd spacings. So instead of every hurdle being, let's say two meters apart, maybe a few are at you know 1.7, you have a few at two, you have a few at 2.2. The athlete kind of has to figure it out. They're they're solving a problem actively instead of running over those hurdles and thinking, okay, coach said I should do this. Coach said I should do this. You know, like uh, it's, and again, it's not bad to have like an awareness of the coach wants me to really fit with this uh, level of my technique. I'm not saying that that's something that coaches shouldn't do. But what I am saying is a lot of times the conscious mind doesn't care about that. And when we solve problems through a series of constraints, the athlete can start to figure things out themselves. And sometimes uh, it can actually help to uh, a little bit of variability can actually help to solidify things that an athlete is working on technically. Anyways, so you could have like a, a slightly variable, slightly random uh, set of mini hurdles, and then you could like go from the randomness into the more uh, like the the more singular sprinting skill. And then you could even cool down with randomness. You could do a set of bounding to cool down, like endurance bounding, which might be common in sprinting at the tail end after I did my sprints. Maybe I'll do a few sets of 50 yard bounce. And then even those could have a randomness element to it. I could put some like cones at different distances and the athlete then gets to resolve a problem, reopen up uh, those levels. You could even, even like playing a game on a, on a low level game, you could kind of have randomness at the end and a little bit of that in there. Uh, so jumps training, very similar. I could go, I could start if I'm doing a jumps training session, let's say it's a bounding session. I could start with some random bounds i could put the same thing i could put just different spaced random cones out and the athlete has to bound and try to hit those cones exactly for each bound then maybe we're going to do a few series of standing five jumps for distance so jump off two legs then left then right then left then right and then we could do that and that's our big kpi for the day we want to see how far we can get uh, and we use the randomness to warm up though uh, you could do the same thing in the weight room if an athlete's going to be doing a lift you could warm up. I mean, you could even do it as the main session if you liked, if you wanted it to be a less intense session from a neurological perspective. Uh, but from a warm up, you could hey, say um, on each rep, and I've seen uh, Michael Zweef will do this, Tyler Yearby, uh, and the, they're really into the motor learning side of things with that. And I've seen them uh, on each rep or at the top of each rep give a tempo before the athlete goes and does it. So maybe I'm doing a hex bar deadlift. At the top of the rep, the coach could call. 303. So now I have to go down three seconds, up three seconds, get to the top. The coach could say 222, two, two, down two seconds, hold two seconds, a centimeter off the ground, up two seconds. Uh, and then I could use that as the warm up before I actually get into my work sets just to make things reactive. And I've had uh, Frank Frensich on the podcast 
Uh, he wrote a book called The Exuberant Animal, talking about basically uh, fitness, if you will, from, from a nature, an observation of nature perspective. How do animals operate in nature? And the one, the interesting thing about nature is that like, if you look at running in nature, uh, or even I guess you could say lifting, not that animals lift weights, but you could, you could say even like, like I'm on the farm and I'm just doing farm work or something. You don't, you never, for the sprint, you never know exactly how far you're going to run in nature. You get chased and you run until you escape or you're chasing and you run until you either catch the animal or it runs away from you in a, a, a manual labor perspective. You're just doing the job till it's done. You're not thinking about all the sets and the reps and all that stuff. And I just believe that mindset is powerful. So again, there uh, to close this out, there is a spectrum of totally structure. You know, we could say even like that bonder chuck side of things for throws and clearly very successful, very effective. And then totally just total random, everything's a game free for all, which nobody does. I mean, you could just say playing pickup basketball at the Y, maybe that's your other side of things. So for coaches, it's just finding... Uh, what end of the spectrum is going to uh, optimally make training come alive? And I will say too, that, that randomness, that aliveness and making it a game even, and games are awesome for warmups, uh, that drives attention, that facilitates dopamine, that drives present momentness, or <laughs> that's probably not the right term, present momentness, that drives you into the present moment. And that's what we want training to be about. We, we talk about how uh, or complain, you go to the gym, you see people on their phones in between sets and all these things, which is the opposite of being in the present moment. So variability can be such a useful tool to create to widen that path so we don't get too narrow to drive this novelty attention present mindedness into the training session hit some outputs and then find find ways to get back out of that and there, there's lots of ways to get into a training session and out of it uh, outside of um, variability and diversity as well but it's a method that i really enjoy using and it's gone a long way for me in my own training and coaching pursuits so hopefully you found something interesting out of that if you have any comments or experiences on your own end, uh, share it in the comment box below. I'd love to hear from you. And then uh, before I get out of here, if you want to read more about these training ideas and topics, sign up for my email list below. It's free. You can get some free ebooks out of it. And I'd love to be able to send those messages to you on my email list each week. So thanks for listening.